when Boston had gang trouble back in the, you know, the, the middle 90s or, you know, late 80s, I used to drive around with a bulletproof vest. And I, I was basically driving with the Boston police who let me go in their cruises and we would get to gun calls where they would be out with their guns drawn and I would be with them taking pictures. And there was one, one situation where it got pretty hairy where there was a crowd around me and a police officer took his gun out and pointed and told everybody to, to disperse, to get out of the way, to leave me alone. It was chaos. It was really chaotic, but I didn't even hesitate to go. But how do I go as close as possible and get as safe, I'd be as safe as possible? So I'm sitting there covering this protest. A protester went through my camera strap, took me with him, and then all of a sudden, in a split second, I realize I'm on the wrong side of the action. I'm down on the ground, and a police officer with a baton is pushing me out of the way. Pick up my camera, pick up my equipment. As soon as I get my senses back, I race and actually end up taking a picture of the guy who threw me down, um, being handcuffed and taken away. But I went to that event. I had no training. I knew nothing about safety. And uh, I just kind of went in haphazardly with sandals, much less, uh, no tennis shoes, bad mistake, and just not being very aware of which side of the crowd to be on. It's just when I was out there, we kept, you know, cell phones didn't work, so you really had no idea what was going on, but we kept hearing things like, oh, another bomb went off, or, you know, just we kept hearing things, but we had no idea what was true and what wasn't. And, you know, in the moment, you're not even thinking, you're just acting and reacting, and um, you're just shooting. But when I went home and I had, you know, a couple days to just sit there and think about it, you know, I was shaken because literally I had no idea what was happening and anything could have gone off, like a bomb could have gone off right where I was. Um, and there was, there's like no order to the situation at all. I took my first photo of the police officers with their guns drawn and the runner on the ground. But three seconds after that, I was right at the fence where the blast, the first explosion had taken place. And a police officer looked at me in the, right in the eyes and he says, you shouldn't be here, there could be another explosion. And we kind of met eye to eye, we looked at each other and I digested that information and I thought about it, but I didn't want to think about it. And I knew it was a dangerous situation. What if there was another explosion? What if another bomb was going to go off? And that's probably drove me more to react, to be angry enough to stay in there, to go beyond the limits of probably a normal person would, would run backwards. I looked for an entry point onto the sidewalk, in through the fence, that I could get closer to show what really happened. So as the crowd got unruly, I realized I needed to be higher up. I needed to have a bird's eye view of what was going on to assess the situation. As I was climbing up through a parking garage and looking down, I realized that shots were starting to ring out. Suddenly there was a, what turned out to be an Emerson student, female student lying on the ground. Um, she had been shot through the eye with a rubber bullet and lying lifeless on the ground. The cops are clearing everybody out. Everybody's telling me, you know, you have to get out of here. But I thought, I didn't see any other cameras around. I thought this is an important picture, nobody else is here. So I decided to stay. No one really has an above shot, so that's what I did. I went into the closest, tallest hotel, um, right overlooking the bombs. I went up to the top floor without getting caught, and I started knocking on doors until someone <clears throat> let me in. It was the wrong side, it didn't overlook the window, so I went around to the next row of doors and the first door I knocked on. Two women came in, one just finished the marathon. They let us in, gave us shrimp cocktail, you know, was saying, oh my God, telling us what they went through and let us shoot out of their window. You know, knowing we were the first pictures of the scene from above. Why is this important to journalism students? Because you really don't get the newsroom training for these kinds of situations that you used to. Um, between staff cutbacks and breaking news and the timeliness of it, uh, you aren't always given your preparatory lessons. So you need to sort of think and practice ahead what you would do if you were sent out to cover like a rail accident like which just happened in Quebec, or if there was a big tanker truck accident involving hazardous materials. Would you think 
to get like a gas mask? You know, are there dangerous fumes? So you, sh you should be thinking about situations like that and how you would prepare to cover them. Uh, it's very important. It's to stay safe. There's two things to really be prepared for. One is uh, the idea of what the what emergency uh, personnel and, and the military both refer to as situational awareness, uh, is that uh, you can become focused on, on the person you're interviewing or on the scene that you're filming or the scene that you're observing. Uh, and uh, in the military, that's called target fixation. Some pilots will fly right into the ground because they're so focused on, uh, on the target. Uh, you want to continually look around you. Uh, um, basically, if your head were on a 360-degree swivel, that would be terrific. Uh, when you first arrive at an emergency scene, uh, you want to just take in what boundaries may have already been set up. Uh, the most common at an emergency scene would be the yellow tape uh, put up by either law enforcement or the fire department. And you have to start by respecting that. Uh, don't get in the way of those that are uh, charged with helping the first responders, the police, the fire, the EMS, the military that were there. Don't get in the way. It's always good uh, to uh, prepare yourself before something happens. And in the cases of fires, in the cases of emergencies, in, in the cases of crowd situations, all the emergency uh, personnel do a lot of training, a lot of drilling on this. And so there's no excuse not to uh, take part in that or at least observe it. A smart reporter is a good reporter. Uh, an educated reporter is a good reporter. Look for a place to shoot that will get better shots, but be away. Try and get up always. Um, up is good. You know, we had some students covering riots in London, and up was really good because they were they found a first floor window. They were still able to zoom in. They're still still able to get all these clashes between police and protesters. You have really two decisions to make. Either do I go and get myself uh, in such a spot where uh, I have some protection, or do I start covering it as a journalist? And that's really uh, a question that no one can answer except yourself. And in those experiences that started here at BU, I've learned a few things. One of which is try not to travel alone. Try to always go with a colleague, a reporter, another photographer, someone who's always going to have your back. Also, rely on the wisdom of photographers and reporters and other journalists who've come before you. Don't ever be afraid to ask a question because there is no such thing um, as a naive question, especially when you're going to a region that you're not familiar with. Also, research ahead of time. Know the situation in which you're going. Know the cultural sensitivities and know the mood and the atmosphere in which you're going to land. Um, and be respectful of that and responsive to everything that's happening around you. Always know your place in the environment. Always know the bigger picture around you. Um, and at the end of the day, always ask yourself the question, is it worth getting this picture? Sometimes it's not, and sometimes it is. I mean, for me, to be completely honest, I just don't know if a, any picture or any story is worth putting my own life in jeopardy. And that's just me kind of trying to rationalize it. Um, I just, you know, I don't think the output of whatever that photo or that story will do is worth putting my own, my own self in danger. It just, that's, that's where I fall on it. I think students, new students, old students, um, especially at BU, they shouldn't be afraid to push themselves and they shouldn't be afraid to take risks and, and make photographs and push themselves. They shouldn't be intimidated. They should just be aware because if you end up being scared or intimidated, you won't get the pictures that are good, that tell the stories. You won't get what's, what photojournalism is all about. But as a photographer, you're always got to be on guard. You always have to be on the defensive but also be on the offensive. Um, if you're too laid back, you're not going to get the photo. You have to, you know, what, 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 I, what I think that drives me is taking it to the limit, taking chances that are reasonable chances, and trying to, to get the best photo possible.